So hi, everybody. Welcome to our Governance Made Easy webinar today titled Getting Governance Right in a Startup. Uh, today we have uh, having a discussion with a very special guest, Nina Lalive, who is the CEO of Enterprise Angels in New Zealand. And on the panel, we have Danica McLean and Stephen Bowman. My name is Sean McDonald, and I'll be a moderator for the next 45 odd minutes. And firstly, thank you for attending today. Uh, we appreciate the effort you've made to be here for our live event and during the session. If you have any questions uh, for our panel, please use the Q&A uh, option at the, on your toolbar. And we'll be trying to get through as many of these questions as we have time for. And finally, if you stay through to the end, which we hope you will do, and as is customary for our webinars, we have a special treat for you by answering a really short one minute survey at the end of the webinar, you'll go in the draw to win our beautiful gift hamper worth over $400. So for those who are a little bit unfamiliar with Board Pro, we are a board software provider, uh, sometimes called a board portal, that we serve about 25,000 users across about 29 different countries in the world. And we enable organizations to prepare for and run their board meetings more efficiently and effectively with, you guessed it, Clever Software. Uh, with less time and deliver more impact and value for the organization. And as much as we are a board software provider, part of our wider mission is to make the fundamentals of governance free and easy to implement for all organizations, especially those with resource constraints. Now, I would like to hand over to our team to introduce themselves, starting with Nina. My name's Nina Laliva. I'm the CEO of Enterprise Angels. Uh Oh, great. Um, in my role at Enterprise Angels, uh, we've invested in over 100 startups and we have 78 live startups. So I hear the goings on a lot of the startup boards and we work quite closely with a number of the directors as well. Um, I also report to the Enterprise Angels Incorporated Board, the EAGP board, which manages the EA funds. I sit on the EA board and I'm the investor director for a deep tech startup and have it coatings. Thanks, Pass Stephen. it over to you, Stephen. Stephen. Hi, everyone. Steve Bowman from Conscious Governance. I've been working with boards and CEOs for a oh, knee high to a grasshopper, essentially, uh, working primarily in strategy, risk, and governance. So, Danica. Well, kia ora koutou, everyone. I'm Danica McLean. Um, I head up a business called Board Administration Services, which provides administration services for boards. Um, that's minute taking for board meetings through to advice on how to structure up your governance documents, what kind of record keeping you should be doing, um, and just helping with overall meeting processes. Uh, I've been involved in a couple of um, insurance companies that have gone from kind of startup phase through capital raises through to looking to IPO, but eventually doing a trade sale um, as a company secretary. So I know well what's involved in the due diligence required and the records that you need to provide when investors are looking to invest or purchase a company. Thanks, Tanika, and thank you, team. Right, let me bring us on to our uh, presentation. Over to you, Nina. Great. Thank you. And this is a very flying overview of what is quite a topic, actually. So we're going to keep it pretty succinct and allow for the time for questions, hopefully. So governance, there are plenty of similarities. Governance is governance, whether it's an established business or a startup. We have the four pillars, strategy, culture, accountability, and compliance. I'd just like to highlight a couple of things that really stand out for me before I hand it over to the panel on the pillars. When it comes to strategy, a startup is trying to find product market fit. And when they're in market, they'll learn things as they go. And that will, by its very reason, will change the strategy. So it's important to be agile and recognize those moments. When it comes to compliance, you don't have as many resources on a startup. You may not have a legal team. You definitely won't have a legal team. So you need to consider how you can manage that. So passing it over to the, uh, the panel. So how can startups ensure that compliance and accountability are you know, looked after in their governance? 
Um, I can just comment on the compliance perspective. Certainly, it's really important um, in terms of the record keeping, what you keep from the very beginning. And I think that's quite easy to slip in a startup when you're very busy kind of hustling and, and trying to build your business up. But just the basics of having a company constitution, keeping minutes of your board meetings, minutes of your shareholder meetings, having um, documented conflicts of interest, um, having a share register, you know, things that you probably going to be advised by your accountant that you need. It's just the actual doing of and, and holding of those things in a structured manner so they're easy to find so that you can provide them when asked. One of the things that I, I know some startups have found quite useful is to actually develop up their own very simple compliance schedule so that here are all the things we have to comply with during the year. Have I done it? Oh, my heavens, I forgot. Or it's coming up in three months, so I might need to think about it. So a little bit of uh, a little bit of preparation beforehand. Often your accountants can give you some, some insight into what are some of the key accountability compliance issues. But in the end, the, the, the one thing I love about compliance is that if you understand what you have to comply with the next question you ask yourself particularly as a startup is so how can i leverage that how can i make this work for me how can i make sure this is actually really useful for me and my business just a challenge for everyone to consider nice Nina. one one thing i'd add to that as well it's really important to have good advisors uh someone that knows the startup space as well particularly when it comes to legal as well and and accounting you know the amount of non-dilutive funding you can get and so on so i'll just add that point um, going on to legal duties, we have the same four legal duties in a startup. When it comes to duty of care, if you have um, displayed care and diligence and skill that a reasonable director would have done in the same circumstances, so that's the test for a duty of care. But the important thing with startups is that uh, you'll be benchmarks against other startup directors. And I've been involved with startups that have had directors that have been on very established businesses and they've come onto a startup board and there have been some very uncomfortable uh, discussions and, you know, it's, it's very uncomfortable for both the startup and the director. So that's a really important uh, difference there to note. Um, acting in good faith, of course, is, I think, very similar in both. Acting in the company's best interests, Something that pops up quite a lot, well, actually not a lot, but sometimes there are misalignments between founders' interests, company interests, and investors' interests. So you need to be really aware of them and ensure that you do act in the company's best interests. And, of course, reckless trading. We're always looking at what that cash runway is doing. It's illegal to be trading insolvent. Um, and, yeah, so tr reckless trading means that there is a substantial risk in what you're doing to creditors losing uh, their money, and that includes staff as well as creditors. So um, I'll pass that over to you first, maybe, Steve. Sure. Well, uh, to me, the, the, the key in this is the duty of care side of things um, in that um, all directors and, and the owner of the, the owners of the business too have to, have to um, be very prepared, have to um, do as an ordinary prudent person would have been expected to do. They've got to read all the papers that they get. They've got to understand the papers. But the most important thing is that we've got to ask questions and you know the, the the gift of any good board of either a startup or a, 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 an, any other sort of organisation is the quality of the directors is directly related to the questions they ask that no one else thought of asking. And so if you're going to put a board around or even an advisory board, you're really wanting people around that that are going to ask you, the, the company, really good questions that we wouldn't have otherwise thought of. So um, you know, to me, the duty of care um, duty of loyalty, the duty of obedience, all those things run in together. But being a good uh, director and actually adding value is your willingness to be intensely curious in everything you do. Donica? I'd just say um, one where I see quite a bit of hiccups is that acting in the company's best interests. When you have startups or early stage companies and you might have shareholder directors on the board, um, what people need to realise as a director is they need to leave their personal agendas behind. Um, acting in the company's best interests is no longer just around getting shareholder returns. It's around the wider ESG thing. It's what's good for your stakeholders, for your um 
for your staff, for your customers, for the environment. Um, you know, as a board, you need to be acting in good faith and acting in the company's best interests. And you might just need to leave that shareholder hat off your head while you're doing those things. Yeah, There's absolutely. a great question just come in, Nina. There's a great question come in for you that says, what happens when you come into an organisation <laughs> and the compliance seems to be non-existent? Your role is to help get it back on track. Do you just have notes that you can't find the old data and don't know how it was done? But moving forward, this is how we'll operate. Thoughts? Yeah, and that is probably quite the case with a lot of them. And, you know, working with your advisors and what you need to do for, to comply and start building that um, structure. Uh, yeah, but I think definitely speak to the advisors. Did you want to add anything to that, Danica? Well, just Steve? there's no better time to start than now. So definitely get those processes in place as soon as you can. Um, and then, yeah, as Nina says, I think talking to advisors about the best way to do things retrospectively. Yeah. Great. So um, board formation and composition, and Steve touched on a few of these items. It's absolutely critical, you know, getting the right board around the table. When do you actually need a board when you've got a startup? Uh, typically, when we've got investment, we like to see a board there. If you don't have a board in place already, then we will look at implementing that structure. And I know that there are many founders that feel a great sense of relief once they have a board that's doing the right job for them because they'll sort of take a weight off their shoulder. They can, you know, help them, guide them with a strategy and give them what they need. That's when you know you have the right board in place. Of course, getting that in place, constitution and shareholders agreement, same as with an established organisation. That will dictate how many board members, uh, how they're appointed, how they resign, uh, any special powers that might be involved for shareholders or investor directors, any veto rights and so on. Uh, and you should always refer to your governing documents, particularly when you're raising capital. It's super important. Getting the right people, use a board assessment matrix uh, to ensure appropriate skill sets. There are certain skill sets that every director should have, you know, integrity, um, you know, asking the right questions, like Steve said before, um, knowledgeable about the area, and um, time for startups. They need that time to be able to put into it as well. But then with a startup, you'll want to have one or two in your board that have specific skill sets as well, like someone with capital raising expertise, if you're going down that route. Um, you'll want someone with exit expertise at the appropriate stage as well. And, and these should be refreshed as well. You know, you need to review the board changes. It's agile when you're in the prototype stage through to when you're in series A stage. You know, it's vastly different, the skill set that you'll need around the table. Um, and finally, your chair shouldn't be the founder, the founder CEO. You know, the, the board is the boss of the CEO. So obvious conflict there. Um, yeah, passing it over to the um, the panel there. So what are, what are some common pitfalls that you'll see in forming the uh, board of startups? Okay, so I'll, I'll kick off with this one. The, the key one is this whole issue of who controls what. And, um, yeah, and, and one of the big issues we often see is where I need a board that represents elements of my sector or something along those lines um, and often what I found with some boards is they get you know, good representation of various sectors sitting on their board shame about the people so they've actually forgotten that the key thing in all of this is to have have the right sort of people that are that are this in you know that have this curiosity that are willing to ask questions that are willing to hold both themselves and the owners accountable for whatever we need to be accountable for um, and it's really seen, and the other thing I'd say, it should be seen as teamwork. So the the owner, uh, the staff, if you're lucky enough to have any, and the board should be working together. The, the board will have more of a strategic overview and ask the harder questions, but it's not an us and a them. And, and I think one of the big problems that I often see is that the board thinks that they are uh, the boss, and so they boss around and they get involved in things they shouldn't be, whereas, in fact, what they should be is the driver of the vision together with the owner. They should be the driver of the strategy, not necessarily writing it, but in conjunction with the staff. So you know, it's this notion of working together but with different relationships, and that's why, please, develop up a board charter that says clearly, here's our responsibilities, here's the staff and the owner's responsibilities, and continually review that. Nina? I have nice. a couple of, uh, couple of questions, Nina. Yes. As, 
as a startup, when you're talking about things like um, the constitution and the shareholders agreement and the assessment matrix and all those things, where does one go when you are a founder uh, of a startup for all those documents and all those yeah, so, things? Yeah. New Zealand Growth Capital Partners has got some great templates on their website that you can use. And within the startups that we work with, we typically start with these templates as well. And there'll be various different things that happen along the way, depending on like the makeup of the cap table or um, the investors coming in, age and stage and so on. So, um, yeah, so we'd like to use those those templates. Right. Uh, so what was that organisation's name again? New Zealand Growth Capital Partners. So that's the government investment arm. Uh, right. They, yeah, invest in startups and um, growth Series A stage companies as well. I have a comment in from Michelle here. Um, she says, chairs shouldn't be founders. Suggest there is an exception for very small cohort of NFPs, passion and vision-based startups for the first year until the vision is embedded, particularly when it's a small group of founders. So she's saying, unsure of what you mean by the board isn't the boss. Did I do that one? Yeah, yeah, most, sure. Most, <laughs> a, a lot of people think that you know, when when they think of the board, they think they're the boss of. And and if you have that as a point of view, then what you tend to do is boss everyone. And the issue then becomes it becomes very operational minded. The board is the custodian of the vision. Is the legal? Uh, uh, it, it is the legal um, uh, responsible agent for what goes on in the organisation. But I would say more that they are the, the vision and strategy drivers and ensure that the decisions that we make around our board table are actually creating the future. So the reason I say the board isn't the boss is that sometimes people have these really weird ideas of what about what a boss should do. And I've seen way too many boards where individual directors or the board itself thinks it's the boss and they boss the CEO around as if they were the CEO because that's what they would do if they were running the organisation. So. Interesting. Nina. Yeah. I think I might have used the word boss as well, didn't I? Uh, so the, and we'll talk to talk about the shortly as well. So <laughs> did you want to add anything, Danica? I see there's a couple of questions there as yeah, well. Just, just on that one, it's just, you know, to understand that it is the board's role to appoint the CEO. So that's where the conflict comes in with a founder or CEO is the chair, um, because often the CEO chair relationship is one of a very important one. And it's just kind of best practice to have a chair that's independent of the company. Um, and saying that you can't always do best practice when you're kind of bootstrapping things. So it's um, you may do with what you have. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. we have a few questions in Nina. You ready for them? Yeah, yeah, fine. All right. Uh, Leighton asks, I've come into a small not-for-profit that has struggled to find directors and trustees, partly due to it being very small, partly due to unpaid, unglamorous, etc. And the challenge I'm facing is the time required by me to bring governance up to scratch versus the time required to get there. Um, it feels like a startup, to be honest. Is there a handy document to guide that I could distribute to the other trustees to help them understand where I'm at? Yeah, let's, um, I think there's something on the um, Institute of Directors page. I believe there's resources for not-for-profits and um, incorporated societies and so on that could help with that. Uh, do you know any, Steve or Danica? Um, I would I would strongly suggest you do a Google search or whatever search you like on board charters and pick one that you think is most represents your board. There's thousands of them out there. Make it fit for purpose, put your logo on it, and then sit down and have a conversation with the board and get them to sign up for it. And at the end, if you really want to get them a, a little bit serious about it, you get them to sign off on it. Now, in terms of finding directors, there have never been more potential directors out there than there are right at the moment. Your job is to make sure that you are not boring and therefore people will not want to join your board. So be very focused on your vision, be very focused on the difference that you want to make and who wants to be part of that. The people are out there, but if uh, if you go and approach it as, uh, look, I need people sitting around my board and it's, you know, and, and we don't have very interesting discussions and we're not here about creating the future, you, you won't get anyone interested. So if you change your mindset about how you go about so searching for directors, you can advertise, you can, there's all sorts of board 
um, uh, websites around for people that are looking for board positions and you interview them and you make sure you get the good people because in the end they're the ones who are going to really add value if you get the right people. Danica? Thank you, Steve. Yeah. A few more questions coming at you, Nina. Yep. Uh, this is from Matt. Do you have any advice of a structure for a new board of a unified association, i.e. a startup, moving from a current federated structure, e.g. Uh, the balance of state member reps and skills-based reps? Stephen, this is you. <laughs> What's a federated structure? Go, Steve. Good luck. <laughs> Okay, so the main the, the main thing in this is that if you can get your directors to recognise that they are no longer representative, even though at law they never could have been, and that they are actually there to create the future for the whole entity itself, and if you can get past the power struggles of the various federated or ex-federated entities about wanting numbers on the board, key way to do that is to actually go out and... and um, Make sure you've got the structure in place to have, you know, seven to nine board members. They're there about um, providing skills and insight rather than representing the various sectors. That takes a bit of time and a lot of discussion with membership. Hey, we have another one uh, here. Oh, this one's an anonymous one. So we, we have an amazing board, but it's very expensive and the culture after a few years changed, changed to become far too corporate. We are now needing to review and cut several costs and get the soul back into the organisation. Is this often so? And do SME companies tend to choose a board above their needs at the time, which be can become a risk to be aware of? Mm. It's, um, I think that can be quite a common story. Um, you know, founders, CEOs look to a point really experienced people who are well connected to their boards but they're not necessarily the right fit for the organization at the time and I think you need to be careful in thinking about who you actually want to have on your board in terms of what you're going to get the most value from you think of a board as um, is there to help you as a founder or a CEO and what you really need. Do you need deep industry experience? Do you need um, someone who's well connected? Do you need someone who can get you good contacts for funding? Um, you know, don't overexert yourself and pay for the best people who are nice and shiny because they might be really busy and not necessarily what you need, not able to give you what you need at that time. Actually, one of my experiences in our startup boards, one of our red flags when we're investing is looking for those shiny directors and then you see how many boards they're on mm -hmm. and you wonder how are they going to have the time to give what they need? You know, they may have that sector expertise. So, yeah, it's a really good point. A couple of quick ones, Nina, before we head <laughs> off. Um, do you appoint a chair first, then directors, or directors first, then appoint a chair? I think it's typically directors first in my experience. Um, it's usually decided as part of an investment. This is from my point of view. And it's usually quite obvious. It's usually uh, someone that's independent. We talked about that earlier. Uh, yeah, nothing else to add on that one. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've one. Sometimes, sorry, Sean, sometimes I've seen where they've, where, where, uh, because they didn't have a board before they've started up they've got the, the, the they've uh, uh, approached someone to be the chair and the chair and the ceo then go out and approach potential other directors as well too so there's there's no right way or wrong way in that um typically once you've got a, a board that's been around for a little bit then the board it depends on what your constitution says if it says that the board appoint the chair well then the board need to appoint the chair if it's silent on that then um then you can do but you've got to make sure that you're in um, accordance with what the constitution says and last question, how do you know what to pay your directors, chairs or advisors? Where do you go to find that information? Uh, when it comes to the startup space, we have some internal uh, sort of reviews and so on, and it can range from, do we want some guidance here? Not sure where they're published, actually, but it can range from options to cash, and it can range from $20,000 equivalent in cash or options um, for a director, and usually about one and a half times that for a chair, um, and it can range upwards as well. So we see a huge range of different um remuneration options. I don't know where there is. I've looked for some resources, some public resources, but I haven't found any as yet. 
EY okay. run a um, director's fee survey every year with the mm. Institute of Directors here in New Zealand, mm. um, and I think that they publish that. Mm. Actually, they- On Board is doing one at the moment, which I just completed, so um, that, there might be some insights from that as well. Great. Okay, Nina, back to you. All right. Okay, so key duties of a startup board, three things. You never want to run out of money. And that could involve a variety of things. It could be that you're bootstrapping, you could be looking for non-dilutive funding, and, of course, there is raising capital. Now, it can take a long time to raise capital. It can take up to 12 months, maybe longer. So if your cash runway is shorter than 12 months, you need to be thinking about where your next capital is coming from. Uh, Second key duty, mentoring or guiding the CEO. We talked about this before and potentially changing them out, making the hard decision um, if they're not being accountable to what they need to deliver. Um, And and it can get very hard as well. It can get very messy. Finally, liquidity for shareholders. Investors invest on the basis of a vision and, and a promise of returns. It's not a donation. Sometimes it can feel like a donation, but Liquidity can come in many different ways as well. So um, think about different opportunities for that, whether that's a secondary market opportunity or so on. Flicking on to the next slide, does that mean we need to move fast? No, you're okay. (laughs) (laughs) Right, okay. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, did you want to um, pass it to the panel for some questions there? Um, Key duties, how it differs from an established board. Uh, these are the key duties of a startup board and any key differences from an established board? I think the biggest difference is you just have to be fast moving and agile when you're on a startup as a director. It's not yeah. going to be necessarily a bi-monthly board meeting where you get a full pack of board papers. You need to be a bit more um, available and um, dexterous. Yeah, yeah so yeah, the think- way... Oh, sorry, to, to, to me, the key thing um, is w- it's very easy with a startup board to get involved in the minutia and get involved in you know sort of semi running the company. Whereas, in fact, you really want to be constantly looking at the big picture issues, not just now, but in the in the in the next six months, the next twelve months. If you're a little bit more mature, then in the next three years or five years, because typically the CEO and the staff are focused on the next three months cash flow. <laughs> What we need to be as doing as a board is always looking outside of that as well as, but looking outside of that. So where are things going? I've seen too many organisations where they have invested so much in this one idea that they've ignored the fact that the market's moved on. They were so last month. So that's one of the roles of the board is to keep its eye on what's happening there. Yeah, absolutely. So I've tried to boil down some of the key differences here. You know, there's the ca- all important capital strategy, never run out of money. Um, there is the extent of the involvement. We've talked about this as well, the time involved in actually supporting the startup, lack of resources and so on. Uh, speed of decisions with these fast moving markets, you need to stay up with it. You need to make decisions quickly. Time is money, literally, cash runway. <laughs> um, and that access to resources, you know, that legal advice team that you don't have as a startup. Um, now, but with all of this, there are some really exciting things that it brings with being on a startup board. And that is that you get to make some really big decisions. So, passing it to the panel, what are some of the big decisions that you'll get to make in a startup that you won't get to make in a more established business or very rarely in the lifetime of your tenure? Um, when you said speed of decision making, most of the problems that most boards have is that they think that more information is always the answer. So let's take a few months to look at this and then let's give it to a task force to look at and then let's have another options paper come up to us and meanwhile the world's move, moved on. You do that in a startup, you're done. So it's yeah. it's really uh, one of the great things that I see, particularly in startup boards, is where they actually understand that there's no such thing as perfect information. Let's try it. Let's 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 get started on that. And this is what um, more uh, established boards could actually learn from. That you're better off to try and change, try, change, try, change, than to wait for the perfect business case and put a whole lot of resources into the analysis. And then when you decide to do or not do something, things have moved on. Done is better than perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Danica? I think um, some of the big decisions that you get to make on a startup board is, um, you know, what are you, what's your next capital raise? How are you going to do that? Is it going to be debt? Is it going to be equity? 
what's the end plan? Are you gonna um, are you gonna sell? Are you gonna IPO? Are you gonna list? Are you um, gonna just keep trucking along? Um, and I, one, I think one of the exciting points is um, when you start to establish an exec team as well. I think it's like a really growing up stage in the company when you actually have execs on board, and it's not just the founder kind of running the show. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, also, another couple of things. You could get to go offshore as well, move into a whole new territory. Yeah. Uh, or you could get to do a major pivot as well from things that you've learned, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, really exciting. Um, and maybe we'll um, maybe move on to the next slide now, please, Sean. So if you're thinking of joining a startup board and indeed any board, you need to do your due diligence. Um, with a startup board in particular, consider the risks. Um, ensure that there's uh, d &O insurance and ensure that you read it as well. It sounds silly to say it, but <laughs> consider what other risks there are that could potentially be mitigated by insurance. Make sure you meet the team. Consider the time requirements that you've got. Um, are you going to be able to um, do a worthwhile job? Will you be able to add value? Um, and finally, will you get excited about it? If you're not going to be excited about it, you probably don't want to be on the board. It's not going to do anyone any favours. Uh, so, yeah, passing it over to the panel, you, have you seen any big mistakes that startups have made when they've, uh, or, sorry, when someone's joined a board and they haven't done the right background? You know, can you give any examples or advice for people considering joining a startup board? Um, one of the things with due diligence always is to not just assume what you see published publicly um, or even sent to you is actually the whole story. So actually asking all the right sorts of questions and there's some there's some really interesting things that you could do as part of your due diligence. My, my, one of my favourite questions always is, okay, so what is it that you haven't told me that you should? And then just shut up <laughs> and see what comes out from that. Um, but it's also looking at um, if you're going to be looking at the uh, the, the organisation, having a look at the uh, uh, the strategy going forward. Have they got a, a good idea of what they actually mean by strategy, or is it just busy, 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 busy doing? busy things. Um, who are the other directors that you've got on there? How have they added value? I'd be, a, a, as a director joining a startup board, I'd, I'd want to know, how do you deal with conflict? H how does that work? Um, who feels that they own the company and therefore won't take any advice or anything? So you, you start to ask those sorts of questions. And to me, it's more about the personalities involved because you can have all the best policies and procedures in place, but it's a real shame about the people. So get to know who the people are. That, yeah. that is really important. Yeah, and that point on do you have the time, um, you have to really understand what the time commitment's going to be. I think you look at probably what they estimate the time commitment to be and then double it. Um, you know, especially if you're going into a newly established board that doesn't yet have any subcommittees, um, those are probably going to be developed further down the line. Uh, and that's going to involve a lot more time as well. Um, and especially if you're going into a capital raising process or um, an IPO process, then that's going to take a lot more director time as well. So just really understanding that commitment. Yeah, so I typically spend 10 to 20 hours a month. And when we're capital raising, that can be a lot more as well. And, you know, if there's fires to put out, there's going to be a lot more too. The questions in, Nina. Uh, sure. First one's in from Richard. How do you move, this is an interesting one, how do you move on a chair that controls the CEO and the board are in net? <laughs> Ooh, that is a tricky one. <laughs> Who wants to answer that one? Yeah. Uh, um, down to your you constitution. Want to try? Yeah, yeah, I think down to your constitution. And how they're appointed. Yeah, normally shareholders appoint directors, so um, it might be that your shareholders need to come together and have a look at the issues. You might need to bring it to them um, if there are, you know, significant shareholders involved. Um, you need to have a really um, high trust amongst directors, and hopefully you've got a few directors on the board and they can kind of come together and talk about talk about what the problem might be if it's something that's um, perceived by the board as well. It's not just something that the CEO is struggling with. Um, you know, I, think you Richard to... is, I think Richard is suggesting that his, his board are inept. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I be very blunt here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can either be, be the director that you would want all your other directors to be, so you can be that yourself and be an absolute pain in the neck doing it, or leave. 
So that's pretty much it. So people will not change unless they're willing to. And if they're not willing to change, and if the chair is monitoring the CEO, then do what you can. Be be the person that you'd like to see the other directors be. And if none of that changes, then just go somewhere where your skills can be used. Absolutely. Next question from Gary. How much dollar cover would you consider as appropriate for DNO cover? Or is that, that can vary. Yeah. Sorry, was there more to the question there? No, no. Does that, is the answer, it depends? It depends, yeah. It depends what stage you are. It, just, it depends which territories you're in. It depends if you have a product or just software. Um, so, you know, these uh, Partridge Advisors are a good um, startup specific um, broker that, that I'd recommend. Um, Partridge Advisors? Yeah, yeah. They do startups, um, mainly startups. Great. Excellent. Back to you, Nina. All right. We've actually reached the end of the slides. I didn't think we'd get through them so quickly. Maybe I could have slowed down a little bit. So I think we're going to open up for more questions. I've got some more questions that I can, you know, put to the panel as well around um, around that board formation. Go for it, Nina. Okay, sure. Uh, let's just see much. Ones we haven't managed to get over. When, when, when um, you're thinking about that, Nina, can you can you make some comment on um, when an advisory board might be a good idea as opposed to a formally constituted uh, uh, decision uh, decision making board? Yeah, absolutely. And an advisory board can be really useful for specific skill sets. So the advisory board, I like that in the best scenario, in my view, is that they'd come in at a specific point in time and they can help. They might come and meet with the CEO, um, you know, for a couple of months in a row, and then they might not be needed for a while. So, for example, in a deep tech organisation, you might have a scientific advisory um, group and they will bring specific skill sets to the table. So they report to management. Um, yeah. Whereas the board is, um, you know, the management reports to the board. In family-owned companies, advisory boards are much more common because the family don't want to give up control anyway. But the, yeah. the thing I found with advisory boards is that they've got to really understand their role. Their role is, you guessed it, advisory. <laughs> so their, their, mm. their key role is to ask questions that no one else thought of asking. Um, their second key role is to ask questions that no one else thought of asking. And their third key role is to ask questions about the questions they hadn't asked about. So it's, it's you've got to be very clear because I've seen some advisory boards thinking that they were the boss as opposed to actually that we're there to challenge and expand the owners or the CEOs um, and to actually provide advice and guidance, but in the end it's the owner's um decision about where they want to go with something like that. But they also hold the owner accountable uh, in ways that staff can't. So it, it, it's quite, if you're thinking about structures of boards, um, you always have the option of a, an advisory board versus a, a fully a legally constituted board. Just read up what those differences are because there's a lot of really good information out there. Nina? Yeah, and I guess if um, someone's on an advisory board as well, just be aware that um, of a dean director and, you know, your involvement on that advisory board, if it starts, you know, if there is just an advisory board um, and you're doing all the role of a, um, a governance board, you could be a dean director and um, in all the sense of that word as well. That's yes. an interesting, yeah. uh, interesting point because uh, someone's just asked here, is an advisor as responsible as a director legally? Not if you're just advising, but if you get to the position where you're starting to make decisions as a board, then you can be deemed a, um, a shadow director, so a director of the board, and you can be held accountable legally. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for that, Danica. So, um, yeah, one of the questions I thought would be good to ask is what role does governance play in attracting investment for startups? Um, you know, I think this is so critical and it comes down to communication with investors. It comes down to ensuring, you know, accountability, drawing on the pillars. It's so involved. So I'll just uh, get the panel's view on that. Uh, I think the key thing in that, that's a great question, Nina, because the key thing is your governance has to be fit for purpose. There's no one size fits all. There are certain basics behind governance and that is, our role as a board is very simple. It's to make choices that create the future 
for the communities that we serve, which include the owners, include members, include whoever it might be, but who are these communities? So for us to do that, we need to know what choices are that we've got. So we need good information coming to us. We need to make sure that they're creating the future, that they're not, they're not just um, knee-jerk reactions, that they've actually put some thought into that. And we've got to be aware of the impact this has on the communities that we serve. So if we keep that in mind, then you can have a board of, of, of as few people as three or four. Um, you don't need a large board. As long as they understand that they're there, their key job is to make choices. So what are these choices? What are the information we need to help us make these choices? And more importantly, how do we make sure that we've got the flexibility that if we need to change them, we can without too much pain? Yeah. Nina, nice. we have one other, one other question that's come in, and I think we'll wrap it up after this one. Sure. Uh, what's your feedback on having a couple of investors of the same company on the board? They're very smart, but I believe this triggers conflict of interest and causing friction. How would you strategically ask them to leave? Okay, well, a couple of things I'd say is, you know, you need to look at your documents and see how are they appointed, um, what role do they play? Um, and, you know, I would say look at the skill sets and whether they're bringing any, but you've got that conflict there. Um, the, is it the conflict of interest that is causing the friction or not? I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, it sounds like it's, um, you know, just friction. So, probably going to be best you look at how you can, you know, what, how can you get rid of them <laughs> according to your constitutional uh, rights? If, if they're the right people for the right role, if I, I'm guessing it's investors from a similar institution, investing institution perhaps, um, it's not too common, but, yeah, have you seen anything else or further comments, Steve or Danica? Um, I, I would make a comment about this notion of conflict of interest. Having a conflict of interest is not bad. If you understand what the conflict is and you put the things in place to manage it, there's nothing wrong with having a conflict of interest. It's what you choose to do with that that's important. So... Um, when you talk about triggering a conflict of interest, every single director around your board table should have the potential for a conflict of interest. Otherwise, why are they there? And, and so, therefore, what we need to do is understand what these potential, real, perceived or future conflicts might be and what have we put in place to manage those. If the person is really good but they also have a conflict of interest, how best do we manage that? It's only when you can't or they won't manage a conflict of interest, that it becomes a problem. I think as well, um, when you are getting investors, um, look at your shareholder agreements, because that's the place to negotiate their seats on the board. And um, once they're on the board, if it's in their shareholders agreement, you can't actually ask them to leave <laughs> because it's dictated by the documents. Yeah, make sure you get good advice when you're drawing up those documents. Yeah. Thanks, Nina. Well, thanks, team. Um, now, everybody, if you'd like to reach out to Nina, Danica, or Stephen, please uh, do so on LinkedIn. I'm sure they'd appreciate your um, your uh, introduction there. You'll receive an email from us tomorrow now, it'll be, which will include a copy of the slides and a copy of the recording of the webinar. So now, just as you leave the webinar, don't forget to complete our survey and disregard the question at the end, which asks, would you like to be put in touch with John, Bob, or Peter, because the names are wrong. Um, we'll announce the winner of the hamper tomorrow as well. So thanks, everybody, for your attendance. Really appreciate it. Nina, Stephen, and Danica, thanks for your conversation today. We will see you at our next webinar, everybody. Thank you very much.